all here. Uh, as you are maybe aware, we have moved from 1 Thessalonians. Now we're in 2 Thessalonians. So tonight we'll be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. So we're going to look at about six verses tonight and continuing with our Bible study in 2 Thessalonians. So let's begin with a word of prayer tonight. So won't you bow with me? Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for the opportunity to come and open your word. Father, we pray, Lord, that as we open your word, your word would be revealed to us through the power of your Holy Spirit with the illuminated word of the Lord. And so, Father, may it be addressed in our lives, Lord. Father, may we see, God, just what the promises are here for that time of the Thessalonians that received the letter first, and certainly we who are here in 2024, that's just as impactful and just as meaningful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to ask you, as I mentioned, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6 and following for the rest of the first chapter, if you'd like to read along with me, um, I will pick up in verse 6. So Paul's writing and he says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Hmm. So God is a just God what he's saying and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire that's a great picture right there dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus these will repay the penalty, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you've heard this question before, and maybe you've even asked it, but you have definitely may have heard it. The question is, how much longer? How much longer? Maybe you've heard that if you've been on a road trip with a car full of children. How much longer? Maybe as an adult, you've asked that question. How much longer? Maybe as an adult, if you or children decided to go to college and you're paying tuition, you're asking, how much longer are we going to do this? I had this great revelation. We're going to change majors. How much longer? <laughs> Sometimes you ask that question when it's just been one of those weeks, and you're looking at the clock, and you're thinking, how much longer until this day ends? How much longer until the, you get to the end of the week? A lot of times we ask that how much longer question. And when we're asking that question, sometimes we think, well, you know, I'm probably impatient, I'm probably this, I'm probably that. But the reality is the question of how much longer is, a, is being answered here, not in the time frame of time, but that it will come to pass. Whatever the Thessalonians were dealing with, which were some, a lot of external pressure and some internal problems as well, Satan was really stirring up. And they were really feeling the pressure of affliction and the pressure of problems. And so they too were asking, how much longer? Now, when, you're not, when we stop and think, you know, man, I don't really need to probably ask God how much longer. Because that really probably doesn't bode well. Well, tell that to Habakkuk. Let me read what he said in your hearing. 
Habakkuk said, How long, Lord, must I call for help, and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence, and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? That's God's own prophet, Habakkuk. Asking God, how much longer? In Habakkuk chapter 1. Still another, King David had a similar question in Psalm 13. Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me? Agony in my mind every day. How long will my enemies dominate me? Consider and answer, Lord my God. Restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have triumphed over him and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. David, the poet, the writer, the king, the shepherd, is asking how much longer. This is good news that God isn't offended by such questions. Actually, in Luke chapter 18... Jesus gives us a story, a story of an unjust judge and a persistent woman. Let me read it to you in case you might not be familiar with it. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect man. This is a wild card. This guy didn't fear God. He didn't respect people. He was an unjust judge. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God, and I don't respect man, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. This is in the Bible. Then the Lord said, Listen, to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who carry, cry out to him day and night? Will he delay to help them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. So here's the point of Jesus' parable. If an unjust judge will grant justice, how much more will our Heavenly Father bring justice? How much more will our God who loves us and cares for us and is our loving Father, how much more will He hear our cries and bring relief from affliction? So to the church of Thessalonica and to application to us today, when you're experiencing this, Lord, how much longer do we have to wait? What's going on? I mean, are you still out there? Are you still in this problem? Are you still in this pain with me? We have to keep Paul's main thought in mind. And the main thought of the whole passage that we're looked at tonight is in found in verse 7. Where it says, And to give to relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in a flaming fire. So that's the main crux of the matter. So the passage tonight portrays two things, two very different eternal destinies. One, of the unending joy of the people of God. And second, of the unmitigated judgment of the enemies of God. That's the way it's going to end up. The people who have placed their faith, hope, and trust in God are going to have undescribable joy, and it will never end. And those who have rejected God are going to have unmitigated judgment that's coming in their lives. So we're going to look at both of these briefly tonight. And so the future of those who are faithful is found in verses 6 and 7 and 10 through 12. When with God, the future is far from uncertain. God is saying, listen, I'm going to give you, and I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you relief, and I'm going to give you a reward. It's going to pass. It's going to come. And so when we think about this as the people of God who have placed faith and trust in God, you're going to have relief. You're going to have relief from your enemies. For example, consider how the too many times how, what we pray about. Now, I'm not picking on what we pray about. I, I don't mean to pick on what we pray about. Jesus said, hey, pray about everything. And we do pray about everything. We pray 
about this thing and the other thing and that thing and this thing. And, you know, last night there was some stuff in my life that I was like, found myself praying. Do y'all ever lose things? I'm not talking about people like that are lost and fought with wandering far from God, coming home. I'm talking about an item that I lost. That's it. So I remembered the last time I saw it. And I remembered that it was at our grandson's. I would say t-ball game, but he corrected me. Papa, I don't play t-ball. I play baseball. So at his baseball game, <laughs> and I was like, I think there was a picture, and I'm going to see if that was in that picture. Sure enough, I went through my pictures, and there it was. I was like, ha, I know I had it on May 11th. <laughs> so now in my feeble mind, I just get to trace back the last two weeks, which was a challenge. Good yeah. But I ended up praying about it last night. It's like, Lord, you know, I don't know where I put it. I don't know where it is. But you know all things. So if, if it's your will to lead us to it, lead us to it. And he did. Lost things. So a lot of times we pray about the things that are important. But on the gravity of things, they're not that important. I mean, it was replaceable. It wasn't forever lost. It could have been found or replaced. It's okay. It's just not a big thing. We pray about bigger things. We'll pray about bigger things tonight. But the Bible also instructs us to pray about whatever's happening in our life, that it would bring glory to the Lord. The Bible instructs us to, to pray about the advancement of the kingdom of God, to be in prayer about what God is doing and how he's doing and him accomplishing his will. And God is always orchestrating human history to accomplish his purpose. And so in the coming of Christ, God will bring a final relief to believers who have suffered at the hands of the ungodly. It looks like right now the ways of the world and the things of the world and the things of Satan have the upper hand. And so in this passage, he's telling us, listen, there's coming a day when there will be relief. It's coming. Just keep praying about it. Keep trusting in it. And so in Revelation chapter 6, we find where the martyrs are crying out, How long until you judge and avenge our blood from those who live on the earth? Relief is coming. It's also coming to be rest from those sorrows in verse 7 in the beginning part where he's speaking there and he says to give relief to those who are afflicted. In Revelation 21, the scripture reads, Look, God's dwelling with his humanity, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, pain, and exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. So, well, there may not be no real rest in this life. Real rest is coming. God is preparing a place in the future for real rest. That's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I take pleasure in weakness, insult, catastrophes, persecution, and in pressure because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So there's relief. There's rest. And there's also reward. Look in verse 10, if you will. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who believed, for our testimony to you was believed. The present sufferings of following Christ <coughs> fail to compare with this promise. For those who face affliction, persecution, and pain are going to have the privilege of standing with him. And we will be with him when he comes. And we will serve him when he comes. And so when we're looking and seeing that we will be together. So in, in verses 6 through 9, if you will think about it, Paul took the Thessalonians on a quick journey. 
They're, they're going through a hard times. Life's hard and it's tough and it, 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 it's, it's bitter and it's, they're getting battered and persecuted by the external world around them. And so Paul very quickly takes them on a mental journey to heaven and he's reminding them, listen, hang in there because you're going to get rest, you're going to get relief, and you're going to get a reward. Just hang in there. And he tells them about what's to come in heaven. But then he reels them back and says, but you're not there yet. You're not yet. We were talking about this at uh, Happy Hearts back in the last meeting at the end of April. There's a great big not yet in our lives, too. Where we're going, what's going to happen, all the promises of the Bible and all the things. But you know what? We're not there yet. There's a not yet to that. So we've got work to do now until we get there. It's a big not yet. Life's not over. We've still got purpose. We've still got a, a position to do and things to take care of. And so here he's saying, now that you know your future is secure, don't forget that God is still at work in you. He's still got work for you to do, and he's got work to do through you. Not yet. Not yet. It's not over yet. But he was just saying, hey, remember... God's not going to abandon you. God hears you. When you're asking how long, I'm not going to tell you how long because Paul would have to say, I don't really know how long, but I know he's coming. And I know it's coming to a conclusion. And so Paul's second request was that by his power, God would fulfill every desire for the goodness of what they were coming and what he was doing. So he's praying that God would consider them worthy of their calling and that he would fulfill every desire in them. And so in verse 11, if we look at that, that's not some perfunctory prayer. He's saying this, to this end, we pray for you always that God would count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. So his prayer went beyond a blanket, Lord, bless this, bless that. He was praying specifically. He was praying specifically that they would be faithful in, even if they, if they were suffering, that they would be grounded in their faith, that they would be steadfast in their work, that they would be faithful, that they would be grounded, and they would be steadfast. So here's the question. When we're looking at the future of those who believe, what is God's ultimate goal for the church until we are taken away? The ultimate goal for the church holistically, and by the way, as an individual believer, you comprise the church, so as an individual and as a group, is for us to bring glory to Christ in everything we do and who we are. That's why we exist, is to glorify Christ. And so even in times of turmoil or, or trouble or suffering or pressure or all of these things that the Thessalonian believers were going into, Paul in verses 6 through 9 is saying, listen, there's coming a hope. There's a promise that's going to be revealed. Hang in there. It's coming. But remember, it's not here yet. And so you don't sit, wait, and idly by, but God's got work to do through you to which you will bring glory to Christ. So there's a second part of this, the future of those who do evil. We found this in, in verse 6 and 8 and 9. Let's look at this. This is, this is terrible. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Dealing out retribution, I'm just skipped over to verse 8, Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So God's judgment is three things as we see in this text. It's just, it's fearful, and it's final. 
In verse 6, we see that it's just. After all, it's only just for God to repay. So for the people of Revelation that are already read, how long, Lord, will you not exact vengeance? God is coming. God is a God of justice. God is a God of holiness. It is righteous for God to repay with affliction those who have afflicted his name and those who have brought affliction on his people. And so God doesn't lay justice aside when you and I come to salvation. You know, because I'm a sinner, every bit of it. And when I prayed to receive Christ, God didn't say, well, you know, Chip, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut a deal with you. I mean, I'm going to judge the whole world over their sin, but I'm going to give you a pass. Uh -uh. My sin had to be paid for. Your sin had to be paid for. And that's why God's plan was for his son to pay the price for your sin and mine. He didn't say, you know, if you just come to me and say, hey, I'm really, really, really sorry. God still says there has to be a payment for that sin. But Jesus took our place. And so it's just then that God is still holy and just and a penalty of sin had to be paid. It's just that Jesus paid the penalty in your place. It was still paid. You just didn't pay it. You accepted that Jesus paid it for you. But it's still paid. It still cost and it still took the way. And so through that substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, it provided a way to show mercy without doing away with the justice of God. And so when we accept God's offer of salvation through Christ, we receive the reward of God's justice, salvation and promise. We have that. So God is Judgment is just. So when he's bringing judgment, it's because we earned that judgment. And not only is it just, but it's also fearful. Notice what he said in verses 8 and 9. Those three words that, that really capture in those verses. He says, affliction, vengeance, destruction. Affliction is the idea of tribulation or pressure. Vengeance is that final and full and complete punishment. Destruction points to ruination. It implies the loss of all things. And so when Christ, through Christ, God is going to settle those accounts. He's going to have the last word. He's going to repay those who know him and didn't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God delights when his name is glorified, when his word is vindicated, and his son is exalted. So for those who have rejected the word of God, who have rejected the name of God, who have trampled the work of Christ, and refuse and refute the work of Christ, and never accept Christ, then that judgment then will be fearful. And then it will also be final. Verse 9. These will repay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. This is an eternal destruction away from God's presence forever. You would have to see Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 13, which speak very clearly to that. You know, we talk about heaven a lot. But you know, Jesus preached as much, or if not more, on hell. He did. Let me tell you some things that Jesus talked about hell. He called it a place of eternal ruin and destruction. He described it as a place of eternal fire in Matthew 25, eternal punishment in 25, eternal darkness in Matthew 22, eternal pain in Matthew 8, eternal separation. In Luke 16. And so of all the biblical descriptions portraying the horrors of hell, perhaps no one is more descriptive than what Paul describes in this verse. Where he says, it is from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. So let's think about that for a second. There's some 
bad, 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 really bad, 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 gosh, awful things out in the world. They sure are. But for right now, there's still God's presence in this world. So could you imagine a world where there is no presence of God? Exactly. Nothing. No goodness, no kindness, no love, no nothing. We're going to look at this in the next couple of weeks, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 begins, when we'll talk about this some next week, but I'm going to jump ahead just a bit. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the man of lawlessness that will come. So let me just jump you over to 2 verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So here's the concept. Right now, the Holy Spirit of God is active in the world. There's going to come a time at the rapture of the church when the restrainer the Holy Spirit will leave. And this world will be left to lawlessness. God's presence will, was, God was going to just say, you wanted it, you can have it. Can you imagine? And so God will withdraw. And so the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians is talking about it's a previewing the Antichrist. The man of lawlessness already exists. We covered some of this when we went through Revelation. I firmly believe Satan has an Antichrist at every age and every generation, waiting for that moment, for that come to that platform. There's one ready in the wings now. Of course, when these individuals die out, Satan raises another one in another next generation to be in that position in that place. So, you know, we, 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 we talk about Peakville of the past. Who would have been the Antichrist? You think of historical figures by just some of the things that we know they were capable of that they already did. And there was still the restrainer in the world but what will happen when the restrainer is gone? There will be no restraint. No cast restraint will be cast off. And so it will come then into its fruition. And so here <clears throat> in the Bible, when Paul is writing, and you have to remember, I, 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 want to, I, I want to ask you to remember or reiterate to you, Thessalonians first and second were some of the first letters that Paul was moved by the Holy Spirit to write. Paul would write this in A.D. 50, 51, and 2 Thessalonians would be just a couple of months after 1 Thessalonians. So this is early on in the writing ministry, but God had already revealed this to him. God had already shown him here what was going on to happen. And so he's talking about through the darkness, the fire, the anguish, the pain of all that would make hell unbearable. The total absence of God's presence is what makes hell hell. You catch that? That's what makes hell hell. There is no God. There is no presence there. There's no goodness. There's no kindness. There's no love. There's no morality. There's nothing there. And so when Paul was writing, he was telling them, this is the way it's going to end. So when you're asking, how long, O Lord, just know he's still working his plan. And his, part of his plan is the final chapter. He just hasn't gotten there yet. Doesn't mean he's not going to get there yet. And so when we think about 
this text tonight, it has a direct impact on how we live today, what is our life like now, but it also certainly has a direct impact on how we view eternity as well. How do we see how we live, but also how do we see things in the eternal scope, in the eternal life that is to come? You know, I don't want to be here. I don't want anybody I know to be here when the presence of God is not here. Can I just restate that one more time? I don't even want people I don't know. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine? People don't care. Just don't care. He sure doesn't know when. Because difference, I and mean, we've talked about this in the spiritual warfare series. A another, I'm not going to say the difference, another, yet another difference between Satan and God. God is all knowing, God is all powerful, God is everywhere. Satan is not. Satan doesn't know. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. He's not omnipresent. He's limited. So that's why he sets up his kingdoms, like we saw in Daniel 10. Satan has a realm and kingdoms and angels and demons, or demonic angels, not his, you know, to be confused with God's angels, but demonic angels. And he has a hierarchy and all of these things filled, and they're always gathering information, reporting, and all the different things. So it, that's where it's always, he's always working. You know, we were talking, well, you don't know because you weren't there, but we were in, I was talking in a staff meeting. Um, so we have a devotional time, a staff meeting, and it rotated around to mine this week, and so I was sharing a little bit about Paul, and I was talking about how, you know, when, when, when we have direction of the Lord on some things, um, I'm thinking about how I referenced a moment ago that it was one of the first letters. And, you know, you're like, okay, where'd you get this? Y'all ever wonder that? Where'd you get this? Who told you this? Well, I was sharing with them out of Habakkuk that I opened up with tonight. In Habakkuk chapter 2, it says, though the vision tarries, Wait for it. So there are times when God directs your heart and your life. God tells you, shows you things that need to be done or that he's going to do in your life. And you have to exercise wisdom and discernment about when you tell people or when this comes to fruition. Case in point, Joseph. You know, I'm just drawing up a picture in my mind. I don't know this. So what if it's family dinner and all the brothers are there, Reuben, Issachar, all the, all, you know, all his 12 brothers are there and mom, dad's there and he, everybody's chit-chatting around family dinner and he's like, guys, I had a dream last night. I want to talk to you about it. Let me tell you what. Every one of you cats was bowing down in front of me. Remember that? That's what kind of how it went down. And they were like, <laughs> I'm bowing you. <laughs> there ain't no way. Uh, beat your, you know, not, these brothers aren't bowing down to you. You're the youngest. You're the runt. They, you know, you're already daddy's favorite. We already don't like you. Well, yeah, well, you're going to bow down. Now, what if he just shut his mouth? But he had to. See, he didn't exercise discernment. And this his mom or dad, you know, is like, well, you know, I don't think that's a very nice thing to say. You're, oh, uh, you're bowing too. <laughs> I mean, that's really how it comes off. Now consider Paul. Galatians chapter 1 tells us that Paul says, after I met the Lord on the road to Damascus, I went into the wilderness for three years into Arabia. I saw no consult from any man, flesh or blood. He spent three years with the Lord. He was taught by the Holy Spirit what he would write in Thessalonians and in other times. He was taught and shown what was going to happen. Two things. 
when God directs your life and gives you a word and gives you a direction, it doesn't always mean it's time for you to go hightail it and tell everybody about it. God may need some time to prepare you about it. You see, Paul was preparation. He had to get prepared himself, his head, his heart, and his life. And then Galatians tells us that he, he, said, he describes it himself. And then I went to Jerusalem and I met with Cephas, Peter, who is the leader of the church, and also of James, the Lord's brother. And I spent 15 days with them. And then they believed me. You see, two people were getting prepared. Paul was getting prepared by the Spirit for what God would want him to do. But then also, the people were getting prepared. Because what if he had just busted on up to Damascus? Hey, I was really coming to kill y'all, but a weird thing happened on the road. I'm one of y'all. I don't think so. People had to have a moment to get prepared too. Preparation. You got to get on both sides. So when God's leading you, showing you, directing you, realize what God is giving you may be for the moment. And sometimes maybe it's our personality. I want to go guns a blazing up the hill. And God's laying, not yet. I'm just laying in your heart for what I'm going to do in your future. Times guns a blazing is not now. Hang on to it. Go back to Habakkuk. Though the vision tarries. Wait for it. Wait for it to come to fruition. If God speaks the word to you, gives you the word, hey, this is what I'm going to use you to do. This is what I want to direct your life to do. It may be for now, and it may be for a not yet moment. But get ready, because I'm preparing you, and I'm preparing others for what we're going to do. I think back in our lives, and my life and I think back in our church life and I think you know there's so many times God has just given us a direction and a vision and it doesn't happen overnight y'all ready one two three look at the new building there you go doesn't happen overnight you ride by you see it I hear it all like that all day long. At first I was like, I am never going to be able to think in here. And then I started thinking, you know what would be worse than hearing that? Not hearing it. Knowing that's what God directed us to do, and we didn't do it. Not hearing it. So I'll take. take that it takes time for God to work in us so I'm finishing up where I started out how long oh Lord God's not wasting time he's preparing you preparing others for what he's going to do hey when you stop and think we're going to hang in this world for as long as God says so because when he pulls us out of here, it's over. It's over. So for the people I know and the people I don't know, they need every chance they can get. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Father, we love you and I thank you for the text, the Word of God. Father, confessionally, we get impatient. We want to hang on. But Lord, help us to hang on and know you have given us the Word of what's going to happen. And we are going to trust that it's going to happen. And as you told Habakkuk, though the vision should tarry. Though it's not immediate. Though it's not right in your timetable. 
wait for it, for it will surely come. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.